Commodity chains are an important part of this book, and one of the things I try to do is explain commodity chains and how they work and the way in which the U.S. Uh, is interacting with Europe across the Atlantic. The way that a lot of people talk about uh, slavery and cotton in the 1820s and 1830s um, is very simply, there are slaves, they produce cotton. I move my hands like this, and then they're in banks in Britain. And, and th so it's, it's a little... Um, uh, problematic. And so I want to very briefly talk to you about the financial instruments that make it possible for cotton produced, uh, slave, cotton produced by slaves uh, to go to Britain. And so if you look at the bottom, first, first of all, I've got interest rates uh, from 4 to 6 to 8 percent. As you go from instrument to instrument, the rate gets uh, higher. Um, what Britain needs in uh, the 1820s and 1830s is something that pays more than 2 percent is very difficult to find. And it turns out that sterling bills of exchange, the financial instrument in the middle, pay more than that. A sterling bill of exchange is, a f it's, uh, in some ways, it's a very old instrument. It goes back to the 16th and 17th century. Um, but it's a document for the future delivery of cotton uh, in almost all cases. Uh, and then the green things are sort of institutions that participate. So first of all, there's a Lombard Street bills, then there's sterling bills of exchange, and then there are the silver banknotes. Uh, sorry, the, the state banknotes. The instruments that are in the middle, the seven houses, are uh, by the 1820s and 1830s, uh, Brown, Baring, and then the three W's. I've forgotten who the other two are, but there's seven transatlantic merchant houses that are taking these sterling bills of exchange. They are attached to bills of lading uh, for cotton. Uh, the cotton is delivered, and they now have title, effectively, to this cotton when it arrives. Uh, the payoff is roughly 6% uh, for these things. Uh, the seven houses then, in their turn, um, uh, I issued Lombard Street bills. That's where they get the capital to make it possible for these transatlantic journeys. And it's a, sh it's a smaller interest rate. It's more like 4%. But it pays better than the 2 or 3% for the local bills uh, that are traveling. The agency banks are a whole collection of banks that are established along the Mississippi River primarily, uh, and they rely on credit that comes from the seven houses. And so the names Baring and Brown and Wiggins and others make it possible for those, these banks to establish themselves. Uh, they, in turn, issue their own financial instrument, which are state bank notes. Um, and uh, the, um, <laughs> the First Bank of Louisiana has $10 notes, which travel very widely on the back the word 10, and then deeks, the French word for 10. And uh, Dixie is initially, Dixie land is the places where these bills travel. This uh, Mississippi and Louisiana along the Mississippi River is Dixie land, the places where the bills of the, of the Louisiana. And so this is a term that's uh, initially used by steamboat um, pilots to describe uh, this, this area. Uh, and so this is the, these are the kind of financial instruments that make this possible, and they're sort of discounting uh, which is effectively borrowing in, the, in our language, accepting uh, lending on, on this language. And what's possible here, and then finally the last thing is land and slaves. And this is this borrowing from the banks, which is often takes place in the context of uh, these, these notes, makes possible this transatlantic uh, movement. And so if you th th all of this depends on commodities. P put very simply, the commodities that are flowing across on the, uh, the upper part are things like uh, uh, linens and Osnabergs and uh, other uh, manufactured goods uh, from Britain, but uh, lots and lots of it, uh, cloth. Uh, the things that are flowing backwards um, from west to east is from 1801 to 1819, uh, this is uh, mostly, well, it's mostly flour. The flour, uh, the biggest export in the U.S. Uh, before 1819, although it doesn't show up in the census, is in fact flour. It goes to the Caribbean. Uh, that Caribbean then takes this flour. It effectively produces sugar. That finally cancels out the sterling bill of exchange at the other end. So it's flour to sugar and then back to Britain. And so flour and sugar are flowing this way. Um, uh, linens and Osnabergs are flowing the other way. By the, after the Panic of 1819, uh, which is caused in part by Britain's corn laws, which are extended at the end of 1818 to the Caribbean colonies, um, destroys the market for flour, helps bring about the Panic of 1819. But after 1819, uh, flour is replaced by cotton, and cotton becomes the key commodity that's flowing from the Americas uh, to Europe. And so that commodity chain is commodities that we're familiar with, 
the instruments are the instruments that are traded. And so what's, when we say that slavery, that cotton depends on, uh, that, that this whole international market depends on slavery, that is true, but it's important to represent, that, understand that, the, that v very seldom are slaves, in fact, the collateral, the direct collateral here, that what we're act what's actually being collateralized is the trip for the cotton itself, the trip for the commodity uh, that's moving from west to east.